At the 19th Party National Congress, the focus, no surprise, is President Xi Jinping's political thought. Since the 18th Party National Congress five years prior, she put forth several major political formulations or frameworks, in particular the four comprehensives which guide China's overall governance and the five major development concepts which direct economic growth in the new era. What do these formulations or frameworks mean and how do they work together? All the internal categories have been discussed for years, even decades. So in their current form, what are Xi's contributions, innovations? What is the continuing significance of socialism with Chinese characteristics? And how does this resonate with China's traditional culture and philosophy? Searching deeper, what are the new concepts, thoughts, and strategies that underline, motivate, and drive Xi's political thought? What is the significance of Xi's political thought that takes us closer to China? China has set an off-promise goal, building a moderately prosperous society in all respects by 2020. One part of the goal is to double the GDP and per capita income of 2010 by 2020. This has meant that the country's average annual growth rate should be no less than 6.5%. Moreover, this has also meant that China's development should not just be focused on growth pace, but also, more importantly, on growth quality. Although China's economy is still growing at a rate greater than that of many countries, challenges and risks abound. Social imbalances, massive pollution, invested interest groups, global volatility. To address such diverse and complex issues, China has an overarching integrated strategy called the Four Comprehensives. Moderately prosperous society is a goal. Deepen reform is a means. Rule of law is a principle. Strict discipline of the party is an action or state of affairs. This new guideline for governance forms the current leadership's blueprint for China's future. To explore President Xi's political thought, I speak with party thought leaders. Li Zhenru, former vice president, Central Party School. Li Shunming, former vice president, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Han Qingxiang, vice provost, Central Party School. And Zhu Lingjun, deputy director, party building department, Central Party School. Since the 18th Party Congress in late 2012, when and now President Xi Jinping became General Secretary of the Party, he has put forth a series of very um, far-reaching political ideas across a broad spectrum, across the, broad, the entire spectrum of Chinese society, economy, development, etc. What I'd like to do is try to uh, look below these ideas and look for the general principles, the fundamental drivers that motivate uh, President Xi to develop these different kinds of policies. President Xi Jinping's governing practice has a people-oriented core that guides all his decisions. Fundamentally speaking, President Xi's goal is the people's pursuit of a happy life. He then expands his thought from focusing on the result to the process towards that result. One typical example is the people-oriented five major development concepts of innovative, coordinated, eco-friendly, open and shared development. Setting people orientation as our target is not enough. We should bear it in mind in the whole process as well. Third, as we strive to realize people's happiness through democratic and judiciary system reforms, both of which are important parts of larger reforms in the political system, we must make sure that every level of party organization and government adheres to people's opinions. Fourth, we should establish a supervision system with people at the core. In this way, people orientation can be reflected in every aspect, from the goal to the process. 
People orientation is the top priority in President Xi's governing theory. Why do we put people at the center today? We used to focus on economic growth. How are the two related? Do they contradict each other? I think not. The development concept of putting people at the center clarifies the purpose of our development as that of benefiting the people. While putting economic growth at the center specifies our tasks, putting people at the center means the sole purpose of development is limited to serving the people. Nothing else is allowed. So the two centers are on different levels. From the, the idea of serving the people, how then do we get these, uh, these uh, uh, kind of overarching ways of thinking, these policies, these strategies for, for uh, governing the country? For five years since the 18th CPC National Congress, President Xi's new concepts, ideas and strategies on governance formed an integrated and logical system. The first aspect of this system is the people-oriented governing philosophy. The second is the fundamental theme of governance, which is to adhere to and develop socialism with Chinese characteristics. The third is the goal for governance, which is to build a moderately prosperous country in a comprehensive way and achieve the modernization of socialism. The fourth is the development ideology of governance, which is called the five major development concepts of innovated, coordinated, eco-friendly, open and shared development. The fifth is the general strategy of governance, focusing on two overall arrangements. One is to coordinate and promote the five-in-one overall arrangement. What are these five? They're economy, politics, culture, society, and ecology. Another arrangement is the coordinated development of the four-pronged comprehensive strategy. Which four? Comprehensively building a moderately prosperous society, comprehensively deepening reform, comprehensively promoting the rule of law, and comprehensively strengthening party discipline. The next is security strategy, which means the general security concept for the country. The one that follows is the strategy to build a strong army, one that is truly powerful and modernized. Still more, there's the international strategy, which means participating in global governance, developing the Belt and Road strategy, and constructing a community of shared future for mankind. The last one is about the leading force of governance. We need to build a strong and powerful CPC. All these points together form an integrated system. They're the new concepts, new ideas and new strategies of President Xi Jinping on state governance. Shen Zhen, a pioneer of China's reform and opening up policy. It was no coincidence that Shen Zhen was Xi Jinping's first trip outside of Beijing after becoming party secretary in late 2012. With such symbolism, Xi placed himself firmly on the side of reformers. Since then, the party has designated a clear roadmap as well as a timetable for deepening reform, with more than 300 categories or areas involved. In March 2017, China's national legislature passed the general provisions of the civil law, the opening chapter of a civil code planned to be enacted in 2020. In it, foundations for legal institutions, doctrines, and transactions of civil society are specified. Moreover, the party is strengthening its self-discipline. Since the 18th Party Congress, 140 officials above provincial and ministerial level have been convicted and punished for corruption and abuse of power. Deepening reform, advancing the law-based governance of China, and strengthening party self-discipline, all these measures are taken with the aim of building a moderately prosperous society. President Xi's governance philosophy can perhaps best be expressed by his overarching 
philosophy called the four comprehensive Sukha Charmiya. Uh, if you look at each one of the four, none of them on its surface is particularly original. Moderately prosperous society has been a Chinese goal for 10 years or so. Reform obviously goes back now almost 40 years to Deng Xiaoping. Um, each of the previous generations have spoken about the importance of rule of law and there have been high-profile anti-corruption cases in each of those generations. So what is it in President Xi's governance philosophy that by bringing these together creates a difference in kind, creates an originality, creates a, um, a mechanism that's particularly designed for the very complex situation that we face today? President Xi Jinping put forth the strategic arrangement of these four points as an integrated, systematic and strategic plan. Instead of being designated as isolated tasks, it is considered a significant strategy. It is the overall arrangement for a country's governance. Being systematic and strategic is a major feature of these four points. We have to promote the four in a coordinated way, as each of the four comprehensives makes an independent system. Without coordination, there would be conflicts that could weaken the desired results and prevent the four from merging into a holistic system. Therefore, I put great weight on coordinated development, which requires taking three relations into consideration in the strategic arrangement. First is the relationship between one goal and three measures. President Xi once remarked that the goal of the four comprehensives is comprehensively building a moderately prosperous society, while comprehensively deepening reform, comprehensively promoting rule of law, and comprehensively strengthening party discipline are strategic measures that follow and serve that goal. Second, Comprehensively building a moderately prosperous society and comprehensively deepening reform both focus in development and reform, which are designed to provide incentives and motivators. On the other hand, comprehensively promoting the rule of law and comprehensively strengthening party discipline were put in place to address problems once incentives and motivators are unleashed. As we make the market alive, we cannot make it chaotic. As we address problems of chaos, we cannot lead ourselves into a dead end. Third, the relationship between the first three comprehensives and the last one must be dealt with well. The CPC is the ruling party of China. It is at the helm of the state, and from the top to the bottom of the system, around 80 to 90 percent of cadres are party members. If the CPC cannot be managed well, China's political regime where the people are the masters, would be affected. If the people are reluctant to participate in reforms or keep themselves engaged for development, how can we possibly achieve the goal of comprehensively building a moderately prosperous society? We aim to advance the four-pronged comprehensive strategy in a coordinated way, so that the four strategies would be integrated into one holistic, systematic and strategic arrangement and coordinated development is a very critical key issue in the process. Since the 18th CPT National Congress, President Xi Jinping has raised a series of new concepts, ideas and strategies as he inherits and integrates the governing philosophies of the party in the past. This is to reflect the requirements of the new era and the development trend of the world. Xi's governing philosophy is still progressing with the times. What are the reasons for this development? The answer lies mainly in three aspects. First, since the 18th CPC National Congress, the historical position of the Party Central Committee's governance practice has changed. Back in Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao's time, China was still under development. 
In 2010, China became the world's second largest economy. So President Xi mainly focused on solving problems that emerged after a certain degree of development. Second, with changes in the basic foundation of development, we should aim for a full transformation and upgrading of society from productivity to productive relations, and from economic relations to social and political construction in a comprehensive way. Speaking of productivity, we've shifted from relying on productive factors and being driven by investment in the past to the current innovation-driven model. Regarding productive relations, we've shifted from allowing part of the group to get rich first to focusing more on common prosperity. In terms of state power operation, we've transformed from a state-led system to a modernized state governing system advancing under the leadership of the party. Regarding social aspects, we've changed from striving for key breakthroughs with imbalanced development to emphasizing coordinated and comprehensive development. Hence, after the 18th CPC National Congress, the new set of ideas that President Xi raised reflected the new requirements of today's society, with complete transformation and upgrading. Thirdly, Xi's thoughts answer current key topics. The new concepts, ideas and strategies on governance by Xi Jinping primarily address the question of what kind of modernization we want after the country has risen from a big to a powerful country and how we're going to achieve modernization and the nation's great rejuvenation. Xi Jinping, The Governance of China, was released in late 2014. The book is a collection of Xi's speeches and provides insight into his concepts, resolve, and ways of thinking about governance. Thus far, more than six million copies have been distributed worldwide. Each of the generations of leaders uh, since the founding of the People's Republic have uh, done similar uh, in, in, their, in their time. As I look around the world and look at different countries, I don't see leaders, uh, a tradition in other countries, for the, the number one leader to put forth uh, political philosophy or political innovations in terms of the underlying philosophical, uh, political philosophy of, of the country. So what is it about uh, uh, Chinese history or civilization or culture which um, which encourages or maybe demands that the number one leader, in addition to being the political leader in charge of the governance and all the, all, all the matters of running the country, needs also to be the, the, the leading political philosopher, as it were. There's an old uh, Western tradition of the so-called philosopher king, which in ancient times was the case, but you don't see that around the world today, but you still see that in China. I think the so-called innovation of thoughts is actually determined by the leading party's identity. Our leaders today have three roles as political leader, organization leader, and thought leader. This is different from the Western practice. For Western parties, their identity is simple, either ruling or opposition party. For the CPC, we had both the minimum and maximum program since our establishment. The second CPC National Congress has put communism and socialism into the party constitution, stating that the CPC must shoulder the responsibility of realizing national unity, modernization, democratic politics, and cultural rejuvenation, which are in the common interests of the Chinese nation and the Chinese people. This is the most important and fundamental feature of the establishment of the CPC, which is different from Western parties. How do you see the importance of uh, uh, chi the Chinese culture, Chinese civilization, for President Xi's vision of China? And then how does that articulate with party history? We did make mistakes in the way we treated traditional culture during the Cultural Revolution. After that, we attached great importance to this issue. Xi Jinping believes that it is the culture gene that makes the Chinese people Chinese. But more importantly, 
He wanted to turn this into confidence in socialism with Chinese characteristics. Currently, cultural confidence is a hot topic in China. It is not only about inheriting the fine traditional Chinese culture, but also leveraging it to serve socialism with Chinese characteristics through active inheritance. This will be helpful in two ways. The first one is in the sense of ontology. We must make it clear that socialism with Chinese characteristics is not just a result of reform and opening up over the past three decades. Nor is it about achieving the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation after the Opium War in 1840. Instead, it is the crystallization of over 5,000 years of Chinese civilization. Then, from cultural confidence on the methodological level, we try to solve various conflicts and problems in reform and development using Chinese values, such as hard work, dedication, integrity and friendship. With these values, the Chinese people work together, struggle hard, never give up and conquer all roadblocks ahead of us.首先他是从解决我们党自身的问题来突破来切入The tradition for party congresses is that it sets the agenda, the policies, certainly the leadership, for the next five years until the next party congress. However, this a term of the 19th uh, CPC National Congress is a little different in that China has set two overarching goals for the country, the so-called two 100s, the first being uh, 2020, the moderately prosperous Xiaogang society, uh, that's approximately the 100th anniversary of the CPC, and then the second goal is uh, in 2050, roughly the 100th uh, anniversary of the People's Republic of China, which is 2049. Um, so these two massive goals, so the first one, the 2020 goal, the moderately prosperous society, will occur within the term of the 19th Party Congress. The second goal then becomes the primary goal of the country. So in a sense, does the 19th Party Congress, rather than just setting an agenda for five years, in a sense, set an agenda for 30 years, more than 30 years, towards 2050? Because that's the trajectory you're on. So does that make the 19th Party Congress a little bit different than previous Congresses? 我们党实际上每一次党的代表大会，它的发展对设计的，对我们党和国家的发展方向的设计。Actually, the plan of every CPC National Congress for the future development of the party and China is not limited to the five-year period. These conferences are like a race pushing the socialist undertaking with Chinese characteristics forward with the CPC as leader. The 19th CPC National Congress is different from previous ones as we are in a new historical stage. Although we are still in the primary stage of socialism with Chinese characteristics, it is a new situation. We can say it is a key historical period. Why do I say so? According to the report of the party central committee, it is a critical stage in building a moderately prosperous society in a comprehensive way, and it's also a key period in building socialism with Chinese characteristics. After realizing the first centenary goal, according to the assumption by Mr. Deng Xiaoping, 
A relatively mature and stable system should have been built by the centenary anniversary of the CPC. After accomplishing this mission, we will focus our effort on the second centenary goal. Hence, I think the 19th CPC National Congress will have a blueprint for the second goal. So I believe the 19th Congress will be a very important event in the CPC's history. I believe the 19th CPC National Congress will be an important conference in party history. It will give them an overall and systematic summary of the past five years, as well as the new historical stage we are in today. It will also present a grand roadmap for the development of the two centenary goals. Besides these, on the great project of party building, the conference will also provide important concepts such as building leadership. There will also be a clearer understanding of the entire country's development goals. At its foundation, President Xi's political thought is people-oriented and rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, the Chinese dream. Xi has set the achievement of the two 100s as his two overarching goals. By around 2020, the 100th anniversary of the party is 2021, a moderately prosperous society, including the complete eradication of extreme poverty. And by around 2050, the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China is 2049, a fully modernized socialist nation. It is the second 100 that's here of interest because in drawing the roadmap and setting the policies to achieve this second 100 goal, the 19th Party National Congress may set the agenda for the next 30 years. This includes the four comprehensives, which describe China's overall development, the five major development concepts, which drive the domestic economy, and the Belt and Road Initiative, which promotes international economic development and enhances China's role in global governance. When foreigners dismiss the political aphorisms of China's leaders as simplistic sloganeering, they miss an opportunity to enrich their understanding. Chinese officials certainly take seriously President Xi's theoretical frameworks. Their performance reviews are based on them. The significance of Xi's political thought is deemed for decades to come. That's Closer to China.